see someone change in front of you, and you know there's no going back. It scares me to death. No one's been here in months. It's beautiful. I love you, you know. I love you too. Does anyone need a refill? Yes, please. <laughs> Have you seen this out here before? It's in the trees. It's all over. Something in the air. I felt a little lightheaded before. I don't feel good. It's like I was knocked out. I, I can't remember. Miss Turner, where's Mr. Turner? It is so nice out today. Hello! What is going on? I don't know. Something from the water. I can feel it on the side. What is it? I'm just having so much fun. I need a hospital. Oh, my dad. We need help. Don't be scared. So uh, we uh, are joined tonight uh, with Jeff, who is one of, uh, I think, the up and coming directors uh, to keep your eye on. Jeff Brown's uh, newest production, The Beach House, uh, came out a couple of months ago and uh, I fell in love with it. So I am super stoked to have him on board to talk to us uh, tonight. First and foremost, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how the project came about and, uh, you know, when you first got introduced to the material and you were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. I want to go do this thing. Okay. So, so as I was saying, I, I, I come from independent movies and it was one of the producers, Sophia Lin, had, was working on another project and I'd been writing scripts in between doing production jobs as a location manager. And I, we had a conversation and she was kind of having a hard time on a project. And I was like, we should try to make one of my scripts. And this was one that had always been kind of tailored to be a small movie. And so she was like, okay. And so then we spent a couple of years trying to get money just based on the script. And that's very hard to do to, as, as an untested director, or as an untested writer, to get funding for a project that doesn't have like a proof of concept is, is very, very difficult. Um, and we were looking, we weren't looking for a big budget, you know, our, our budget was in the realm of about $750,000 to do the, to do the movie, but even getting that amount of money is very hard if you don't have a track record. So then I made a short, um, we shot it in one day in my apartment and for, for next to nothing. And then that short got into a bunch of festivals and that really kind of kicked off the process of, of getting uh, the beach funding for the beach house. And it, it had, by that time, it had become close to what you you see it, it was a, a co i was very interested in the idea of a cosmic horror film which is yeah. uh like hp lovecraft but really the, the writers that influenced him more than him per se but it, it was both of those things and i wanted to make a contemporary version of what he was trying to do in the 20s and 30s um but it is much it wasn't necessarily about you know lovecraft specifically but just kind of his approach to to fantasy and to horror really and then sure. um uh you know we were we're that's that kind of led us to where we are now yeah well that's great and, and i'm i'm so glad that you brought up uh, the lovecraft element right 
because yeah. in, my, in my review of the movie and to kind of every everybody we talked about in fact uh the co-host of the podcast and i um did a, a live tweet when uh it was on shutter and it was a, it was a big deal and we were really proud of that uh particular performance in that we always framed we like weird big w weird stuff right and the beach yeah. house is very firmly rooted in that and and we lovingly called it like um a color out of the sea as opposed to a color out of space can you yeah. talk can you further kind of talk some about the big w weird elements of this movie and you know like how you went for the things that you went for because they're pretty rad they're pretty good <laughs> thank you uh so I think the, the question for most filmmakers, especially in horror, is for, for the filmmaker to, to make something that, that he or she hasn't seen before and that the audience hasn't seen before. And so I'm a very avid film watcher. So I think the goal was to see a movie that maybe wasn't being made or that I felt I wanted to see. So it's like, it's like when I put the, the, that on, that's what I wanted to see. And that aspect of, of horror fiction and weird fiction, I, I want it, the movie is a weird movie. That is, that yeah. is it to a T. Um, and that's based on, if you look at Lovecraft has a, uh, an essay called um, Supernatural Horror and Fiction. And it's about, there's a two paragraph description of what a weird story should be. And our film, if you watch it and with that in mind, you'll see that it is exactly what he's talking about. That it's a, an emphasis on atmosphere over uh, scares and over explanations in, in a weird way, in a weird, pun intended. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I, through that, I started reading more of the authors that really influenced Lovecraft. Like I read uh, Arthur uh, Mackin, who's a uh, mm -hmm. Welsh writer. Uh, he has a story called The White People that is very, very strange. And um, there's an, uh, William Hope Hodgson was a writer that I liked and, and Algernon Blackwood. I read it. And then it kind of came into vogue around the same time because that was uh, when True Detective, you right. know, he, he has references to The King in Yellow, which was not one of my favorites of those. But that really, I think that was helpful in getting us some funding because it kind of, before trying to explain cosmic horror to, to people when there, there is no other reference besides, oh, it's Lovecraft. And then most people, especially, uh, you know, I, I live and work in New York, it, it, they kind of, they, they turn their nose up at it. And I, I, I like like some of the specific Lovecraft ad adaptations. I love From Beyond is a great movie and Reanimator. But beyond that, those movies, there are a lot of them are not great. And they kind of, I think a lot of Lovecraft is in the, the public domain so you can uh, adapt it without paying a licensing fee. And I think that's kind of diminished the power of some of his writing. I mean, he's a very dark, you know, very, he, he's a very controversial writer for a lot of reasons, right. but he, his the his imagine his sheer imagination, which is my draw to a lot of genre, his his imagination is, is just really really strong. I mean, you know, I, I think that he's a very strong American writer in in good and bad. I, I think that yeah. he's he's emblematic of of America for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I I loved that you mentioned the atmosphere that Lovecraft uses so effectively, because we see that a lot uh, in, in your movie, and, and I think is a really convenient and great way to get out of some of the controversial stuff um, that Lovecraft is, is discussing. Yeah. In the beach house, there's this, a couple of brilliant scenes where we see the beach, right? And, and just our, our, our two um, leads sitting on this, this vast, barren, uh, not so fun looking beach. But the entire film, at least to me, felt uh, really claustrophobic, very close, right? So can you talk some about, and, and maybe this is, you know, being able to find those spaces, right? Like, it, and that was essentially your job, right? Before, uh, before you did this film. Can you talk some about that juxtaposition? Because I really found that to be super effective. Something that, that's, that's claustrophobic and open at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I kind of have like a, a back kind of reverse engineer answer to that because part <laughs> of it was also about being in a leisure place at a time when it's not pleasant. And, and I was kind of the, there's a story my mother told me about fishing, her, her father going fishing where there was a gas leak in the cabin. Okay. And so that, that kind of contrast where everyone got sick and, and her, her father saved everybody because he smelled the gas and got sick and got them out. So that's kind of 
in, in the story as well. Uh, but it's also when you go on vacation, if you travel internationally, sometimes your stomach adjusts to the area so that you're in these beautiful places where you're supposed to be having a great time and you're sick in your hotel room for three days. Yeah. Or I had altitude sickness when I was traveling uh, years and years ago. And my traveling buddy and I were, were sick, like painful. And we're like, we're going to die in this, in this place. We're supposed to be really enjoying ourselves. And so that was kind of the irony of it. And I think that that sort of irony plays into the claustrophobia of an, of an open space, of a, making it agoraphobic. Um, because it's, and it's interesting in the context of, of the isolation that people are feeling now. Yeah. You know, she's, she's alone on the beach. And we were talking about, the, I was talking about this the other day, but the, it's like horror, the question of horror is always, what is the worst that could happen? It's like, what's the, the worst scenario? And being alone on a beach and somebody having an emergency situation where there's no lifeguards and there's no one around. So as much as it's the space then confines you because there's there, no matter how far you go, there's nobody there or, or it, it, there is no solution to it. So I think that might play into kind of what you're talking about, the, the contrast of, of open and closed at the same time. And, and similarly, like how we are isolated, but you know, you, if you're through your connections uh, through technology and whatnot, we can be conversing with people in other countries now. So as much as we're isolated and claustrophobic, it could feel very open that yeah. we can do that. So, I mean, I, those are the types of contrasts that I, I like, I respond to. I like things like that where it's, it's not, there's not a, a firm answer to it, but really more kind of sending your mind in, in kind of circles, really. Yeah. Like, sh should I feel comfortable or should I not? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, and, and I think that's a, a great way to put it. Like it, it, it keeps you uh, off balance, right? Which, which adds to the, to, to the horror for sure. So as, as the movie progresses, right, we get, uh, I, I would definitely put the beach house in, uh, there are a couple of articles and I, I think they're great that talk about like horror in the daylight, right? And hi highlight some movies like Midsommar who, you know, pretty much all the bad stuff happens in, in the daylight. And I think the beach house fits into that, at least the first half, right? And then yeah. the second half, there is a pivot, and I think uh, maybe some to, to reconcile the smaller budget, but also to add more of that atmosphere. Your use of fog is so interesting and great in this film. Can you, like, is, is that all, like, a big fog machines? Was that the intent, or was that just, like, a happy accident? Because it's, it's, it's pretty great. No, I mean, we were kind of hoping for the happy accident. Um, <laughs> in, in, I think filmmaking you know, filmmaking is not a very, it, it's like you kind of, it always feels like panning for gold in a weird way. Like you don't, it, sometimes the accents are what you want. You know, they talk about Kubrick and David Fincher doing hundreds and hundreds of takes. And you kind of see that like the, the, the real kind of comes accidentally. And I, I think they're looking for that. And that's why they would, I, I would never speak for those directors, but <laughs> it, after making a movie where we did not, we never, I think the most we ever did a one, one, shot was like 11 takes because something was like technically wrong it wasn't going right technically but most times we would do two or three takes and get done and, and our actors would get it we have to move fa very fast we don't have the luxury of shooting 90 takes but then at the same time i was like it makes sense now i get it i, I could do that i could do 90 takes uh i'm not going to but i could um <laughs> but um yeah now now i forgot what was the question where were we uh oh. use of fog yeah <laughs> oh yeah, using yeah. the fog so I want, we really wanted, the, the film was designed to be flexible. Uh, you know, you kind of, if it's raining, you know, you have to be able to, to adjust to the elements. We didn't have a stage. So like on bigger budget movies, if it rains, you go to stage and you shoot your stage work. We didn't have a stage, we had a house and you could hear the rain when it rained. So we were at the mercy of the elements in a lot of ways, not just the rain and cloud cover. We needed sunny days and like we got four out of 18. So that was like, that was the only way, you know, that, that it was tough. We had to adjust to it. And I was really hoping for very foggy weather for at least a day or two and we never got it. And so we just went to town with the fog machines and <laughs> do, dealing with fog is very, very hard uh, on a budget and just in general, because if you have over three miles an hour of wind, the fog will not hang. So you, we would have, I mean, the, the uh, our production designer, uh, Paul Rice and his art director would be running around with literally fog machines hooked up to like lawn mowing machines that would just blow the smoke and we would get it and they they went through gallons and gallons of, of fog juice sometimes as many as eight 
machines at once. And it was, um, it was very challenging. I would not recommend it. And also we shot in Cape Cod. So that's like between two massive bodies of water, which is windy by nature. So trying to do fog scenes in Cape Cod, not advisable. Uh, <laughs> but so then, but it would become a thing where our assistant director would be like, hey, Wednesday is looking like they're going to have zero to one mile an hour wind. We have to do all the fog scenes. So we would change the schedule and go do those or it's like and then the next week you'd be like we got sunny days on wednesday and thursday it looks like we're shooting the beach and so the movie was really designed you know it was designed to be that type of flexible shoot because from my production experience i just saw so many times where a scene would be written to be this beautiful day and they have one day to do it and the, the day's overcast or rainy and then the scene just doesn't work because it looks yeah. gray and depressing and it's supposed to be hey we're having a great time at the beach and like it just, um, when you don't have tons of lights to either, to also shape it, to, to kind of bend the elements to your, to your, um, you know, uh, to your will, we were at the mercy of the elements. And I, I think that really kind of plays into the themes of the movie as well. Sure. I, I, I would have frustrating moments to talk to the ocean and be like, come on, give me a break, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, we're going to give you a break. Maybe not the kind you want, but yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Interesting. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I, I have a couple of a uh, couple more questions before okay. I, I let you go and and sure. I've taken too much of your time anyways. But no, nah, it's fine. It's all good. Uh, I the the squiddly diddly gross out elements of the film, right? I think are really effective, and there aren't a, a ton, right? Like in in describing this film out, it, it certainly has some of those elements, but it is not a movie that is entirely those elements. Can you talk about some of your influences of like? how you designed uh, the transfiguration of humans, but also, you know, the, I don't know, the, the weird alien thing that happens to be, you know, evolving in our characters' bodies. Yeah, um, so, I mean, I love, uh, I, I, I came of age watching movies in the 80s when they had, you know, practical effects and gore effects. So I, I love, you know, Cronenberg's movies, the Videodrome and The Fly and Shivers and his kind of the clever, I like the cleverness of, of those directors. And, and John Carpenter, of course, with, you know, Prince of Darkness is one of my favorites of his films. And then, you know, George Romero. Um, and also, I, growing up, I'd always like to see how they did those things, even though I was nowhere near filmmaking when I was a kid. But I was, I'd always see like, oh, how do they do that? And I would, you know, how to put a bladder on the back of a knife so that you make blood jet out of your wrist. And I, I thought that stuff was fun. So there, that cleverness, and I, I, I really liked it as a filmmaker too. It kind of, uh, it takes the pressure off some things because that's the focus. It's like, we've got this effect that we have to do. And so then everything kind of revolves around that. And it's almost, it makes things easier. It's, it's back to the painting for gold thing. It kind of like, it's a, and also with actors, you give them something to do, it kind of distracts them so they become more natural in it. Uh, and so the design of it was, a lot of it was we tried to be based in reality. I, I looked at pictures of, of jellyfish, uh, pictures of burns, which was really disturbing, uh, actual ones. And so that those would be, I'm very uh, visually, like I would do a lot of references and send that to people and be like, I want it to be this plus this plus this. It's like the barf monster from Poltergeist 2 mixed with, with the, you know, it's like those types of things. Uh, because if, especially when we're kind of creating something a little bit new, I mean, it, there's zombie-ish elements to it. There's, there's elements of it, but I wanted it to be something separate from that. So it's like, oh, here's this picture of the woman's eyes from Fulci's The Beyond. How can we do that? You know, and then that's what we want to do with their eyes. And then mix it with, you know, other movies uh, too. And if you're not, you know, everyone's like, oh, I know what a zombie is. Or I know what a, a vampire is, but you really have to be pretty specific when explaining to the effects artists when you're trying to make new things on a budget because they are like, well, we got one shot at this. So if it doesn't look right, it, then it doesn't look right. That's how right. it goes. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, like uh, the, the scene where she pulls the, the sea worm right out of uh out of her is so good and brutal and like i like i'm not a squeamish guy right so it takes yeah. a whole lot out of me to be like oh oh you know and and so i i think your production design i think you uh deserve all the credit for uh creating this thing that that 
makes us squirm because we we could see things like it especially if we go to the ocean quite a bit so yeah, yeah I, I think i looked at videos of bot flies Have you oh yeah seen? i can see that oh yeah um, but it is my and and when we our crew is small so when these scenes would come up it would be all hands on deck so it's like our production our art department our effects department the makeup department they would all be there with like squirt bottles and we used you know substances to make slime we'd smear it on their faces but like really with that scene and the kids love that scene. Yeah, um, it's good, it's good. It's, <laughs> it's Liana's performance is what really sells it though. She's selling, you know, the actors in a way are salesmen. They're salesmen for the movie so that they're the biggest, they're the draw of the movie. You know, you look at the faces, the most interesting subjects, so you're always looking at their faces, but you know, the scene wouldn't work if, if Liana's performance wasn't just so strong. And she just, she sells the hell out of everything in the movie, but really that scene, it's, it's as much as, the effects, the effects wouldn't work if they worked in a vacuum. So it's like her, she just puts the, you know, the, the grace note over all of it. And it just really comes together. And I, and she's the glue of that, of those sequences. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. And I think it's believable. And uh, probably you and I could talk for another half an hour about that kind of body horror element, because that's really what it's about is this foreign body that is, you know, trying to get inside of you. Uh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. It's great. It's great. But yeah, you're hundred percent right. If, if, um, if she is not believable, she doesn't go for it, then the whole thing doesn't work. But yeah. she's fantastic throughout the whole film. So. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so the last question I like to ask directors. Okay. As part of the horror pod class, the, the podcast that Signal Horizon produces, we always pick four movies that are like, if you like uh, this film, right? We just talked about his house, right? And so uh, each one of us picked two movies for a total of four. Uh, then you would like these other movies or these other movies have some of that influence or influenced this movie. If you had to pick two, if you want to give me four, that'd be great too. But oh, yeah. two, two movies that you think if, if uh, other people are like me and they like the beach house and they want to go see something similar or at least see where some of those influences came from, what movies would you, would you say here, here are um, the Jeff Brown, you know, influenced movies. Well, I, so just to let you know, when, when I'm writing scripts and preparing movies, I make a recipe. And the recipe is books, movies, comics, art, photography, just a list. I mean, That's awesome. yeah. it's several, several pages long with music too. And sometimes they will get down to like specific shots that we will, um, we are going to pull all of this in there. So there's so much that the audience doesn't know where it came from. Okay, cool. Uh, so some big ones uh right off the bat i would say cronenberg shivers his first okay. feature uh it, it's a it's a big one i think it's I, it's one of my favorites of his it's very funny very disturbing very gross uh and very sexy in a, in a way uh i would recommend that and it's also done on a budget that was a big influence um I think if you want to go old, there's a lot of 50s horror films in there. You know, you can go to the, the obvious ones like The Blob and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but kind of an obscure one is the, the uh, Quatermass Experiment, which is known as yeah. The Creeping Unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the, the writer, Nigel Neal, uh, who also wrote, he wrote Halloween 3, but I think he took his name off it. He's kind of a cranky British writer, <laughs> but his approach to science fiction, I, I really responded and I watched one of his uh, another one called The Stone Tape recently, which I really liked. And there's a, there's a, a smart, he's a very smart writer. But of all of those 50 science fiction ones, I think that's one of the most interesting ones. Um, and then also kind of the movie is a, is a bunch of things smushed together. But I would also recommend the movie Like Crazy, which is not a horror film. Um, okay. But it was, uh, it, it's a independent love story with, I think, uh, Anton Yelchin and uh, Felicity Jones. Who, all right. And... Uh, it, the way it's shot, you'll see it's very naturally lit of, you know, lots of close up. You see how strong of an actor, uh, how strong they are as actors. Um, so those, those are, th I'll give you three. How, those three would be, hey, oh, one more. There's another kind of obscure 80s sci-fi horror movie called Extro, which is my favorite movie poster of all time. And it is bonkers. The movie makes very little sense, but that's what makes it, it great. I would, it's very, it's getting hard to find. It used to be pretty available, but I think it's, it's pretty hard to find these days, but I would highly recommend it. It's, it is nut. It's bonkers. It makes zero sense. And it's, it's just great. It's disgusting. Uh, it's kind of funny, uh, but it's, that's a good one. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if we ever um, feature one of those movies on the horror podcast, you want to come and, uh, 
talk to us about it for half yeah. an hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> or, or, or four or five hours. No, I'm, but yeah, sure. I'm, totally. Absolutely. If you guys get around to it, if, I think showing shivers in a class, I said, as I said that, I was like, that would be a little weird. <laughs> a little, yeah. A little bit much maybe. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I, 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 so I, I teach a, a college class called monsters will save us all about, uh, monsters as social problem metaphors for, um, high school kids. And it, like they all sign waivers so i get to i get to show whatever i want to i get to kind of talk about whatever i want to because mom and dad have signed us off so we we might save uh shivers or something like that for more of that environment or yeah, you start know. with invasion of the body snatchers that's a great classic movie for yeah. i think high school students uh yeah. and, and the metaphor levels of it are very very strong yeah uh, I, I love that aspect of horror too the, the metaphor of frankenstein is one of the best metaphor you know metaphoric stories you know, ever it's, it's, we're still the truth of it. It's such a, it's very true. And so, you know, I think about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm just lucky enough. Somebody pays me to kind of talk to, talk to kids about it. You know, like, yeah, like, that's I, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I well, had that class. <laughs> I, know. Nice I know me too. That, that was kind of uh, the, when an old professor of mine from the university I graduated from was like, I'm looking for somebody to fill in, to teach this summer school thing. I'm like, well, I'd be happy to do it, but can I talk about what I want to talk about? And they're like, yeah. So sometimes <laughs> it works out, man. Uh, I, I know I said last question, but just uh, real quick, any new projects coming about? Anything we're going to see your byline on here pretty quick? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say we had, some, we had a pretty good week, so something, something's coming up. Uh, you know, it's another horror-ish movie. Um, awesome. But taking it in a, in a totally different direction. Uh, but it, it's some of the things that, you know, I, I would never say, like, well, I did a horror film, so I'm done with with horror. I, you know, I, there are things that I would love to work on from Beach House a lot. So I learned so much making it, and uh, you know, that's the biggest thing is like until you've gone through the process of making it, you you really it's hard to mimic that and and to grow as a filmmaker. And so, I, I, there's another one that'll hopefully be coming, you know, in the next year or so. So awesome! Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, well, very good, Jeff. Thank you so much for all of your time. I, oh, I appreciate no problem you know, bearing with us through all the technical difficulty and, you know, rescheduling yeah. and all that jazz. But uh, yeah, let us know. Let us know when uh, your new stuff comes about and uh, hopefully we'll have you on the full podcast sometime soon. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so awesome. much. Yes. Take care and be safe. You too. Have a good weekend. Mm -hmm.